wonder if a couple of our members are still having a difficult time coming in under this new format, but let's see what we've got. Let's see, Natasha, do we have six participants, six members at this point? Yes, we do, I believe, have at least six members present. Um, and I can do, as a reminder, a roll call oh. um, attendance. Um, and I would ask that each commissioner state the name or their location of where they're oh, yeah. staying remotely today. Okay, I see Phil just got in here too, so. All right, um, let's go ahead and get started. It is uh, about 8.31 a.m., uh, February 23, 2021. This is the meeting of the Legislative and Human Resources Committee of the Kent County Board of Commissioners. This meeting is taking place on the Zoom format pursuant to MCL 15.263A. The Legislative uh, and Human Resources Committee will conduct its meetings via electronic communications to protect public health at any member of the public wishing to listen to the proceedings or provide public comment may do so by using the following internet connection or phone numbers and passcode below. And that is public comment at kentcountymi.gov. All right, will you go ahead and do the roll so we can uh, identify who's participating, who's here? Yes, and as a reminder, please um, just state the location of where you're participating from. Um, Commissioner Burrell. I am present, uh, located in the city of Randall. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Hennessy. I am here. Um, I am not on the way I want to be on. No, I'm on my phone, and I don't know how. I, this is uncomfortable. I'm here. Okay. Commissioner Coleman. Commissioner Coleman. Commissioner LeGrand. Here, City of Grand Rapids, Kent County. Commissioner McLeod. President, Kentwood, Michigan. Commissioner Ponstein. He's trying to get on. He's been messaging me. Okay. Commissioner Skaggs. Here, East Grand Rapids, Kent County, Michigan. Commissioner Teal. Here, Grand Rapids Township, Kent County, Michigan. Chair Steck. I am here in the city of Walker, Kent County, Michigan. Okay. So we are only missing two members and it does sound like at least one of them is still trying to join us. So I will work with Commissioner Ponstein about getting him in. Okay, and Commissioner Hennessy, you are, uh, you're using your phone access, but you're able to hear and participate. Yes. Okay, good. As long as I hold the phone in my hand. <laughs> All right, I, we'll try to keep it at another hour so you don't wear yourself out. So. You've got a meeting coming up after this. <laughs> That's true. Well, then you'll get your exercise for sure. All right, let's go ahead with the first item, which is public comment. If there's anyone from the public uh, in this meeting that wishes to address the uh, Legislative and Human Resources uh, Committee, you may do so by identifying yourself. Uh, raising your hand or using the call-in method we described, and um, I will recognize you. I see no hands raised. There are, are there no any messages. inquiries? Yeah, no new messages in the public comment email inbox either. Okay, let's move to the next item of business then, which is approval of the minutes uh, from the January 26, 2021 meeting. Is there a motion to approve? Mark Burrell. Motion to approve by Commissioner Burrell. Support? LeGrand. Support by Commissioner LeGrand. Any questions or comments? If not, all those in favor say aye. 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 
That is a presumptive uh, yes, so we'll take that as approval and move on to our next item, which is a presentation by Becky Becker, who I see is here from Public Affairs Associate for our legislative update. Good morning, Becky. Good morning, Commissioner. Good morning, Commissioners. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you this morning. I have quite a bit to cover on two significant pieces of legislation of importance to the county. So. Um, I will try to be as brief as possible, but there's a lot of detail in the budget as well as the supplemental. Um, on January 20th, the governor proposed a pretty significant supplemental to the legislature. It's $5.6 billion. $5 billion is in federal funding and $600 million is in state funding. Um, I'm going to come back to that because that's another piece of the puzzle. But then on February 11th, the governor also sent to the legislature her proposed budget for the 21-22 fiscal year. For the most part, if you were to describe it, it would be a flat budget. There are no significantly new programs other than COVID related, but no longstanding new programs in this budget. And for the most part, programs that did receive any increases, it was a 2%, which is just um, a little bit above <clears throat> um, it, it, the inflation rate. So if you look at county revenue sharing, that was a 2% increase in our county revenue sharing. Universities, colleges received a 2%. Uh, school districts that currently received the minimum pupil foundation all, also received uh, the 2% increase. Uh, but for the most part, it was pretty flat budget. But there are some significant programs that I just wanted to run through with you um, in general. Um, the Department of Health and Human Services, which is the significant part of the budget, which is about $31 billion of this budget. There are two or three significant changes in that. And uh, the governor's proposing spending 360 million more. And that is to make permanent a $2 an hour increase wages to direct care workers. That's also in the supplemental. It has been in previous supplementals during COVID and she wants to make this a perfect uh, permanent within the budget, which would cost $360 million. <clears throat> the governor is also proposing uh, providing $337 million to nursing homes for the loss of, um, of I, I guess, access to services that they have not been able to receive because of COVID. There's also $29 million to pay for implementing the Raise the Age Law, which shifts most 17-year-olds accused of crimes uh, to the juvenile system and out of the adult criminal system. This is uh, by state required to cover costs for this change. There's also a $120 million increase for the Michigan Reconnect program. If you'll recall, that is the governor's program that expands up uh, tuition for those 25 and older to allow them to go to community college. There's also $60 million for the new uh, <clears throat> Future for Frontliners program. And that was a, a program that the governor announced during the middle of COVID, which would cover tuition for pandemic essential workers. And there's another $12 million in there to cover childcare, tutoring and career counseling for participants of those programs. There's $15 million increase for the Going Pro program. Um, there's also in, uh, increases for the Great Lakes and Energy, which would help a number of clean water programs. Uh, one of the new programs that the governor's budget is $250 million for state recovery service to help those students that are ch being challenged academically, physically, or mental health in the wake of that pandemic. Probably the biggest surprise in the budget was the governor announcing $300 million to help with um, our bridge, bridge repairs and replacement. Uh, the governor has ad identified about 120 structures as part of the supplemental request as well, but that was something that I don't think the legislature anticipated. Uh, the state police budget will also include funds for a trooper recruitment school, uh, 120 new troopers, which bring the force up to 2,100. And there's also funds in the Department of Corrections budget to um, add more corrections officers to offset some of the retirements. The governor is also proposing to put 175 million deposit into the budget stabilization fund to help uh, secure those funds, which was taken away during the pandemic. The legislature and the governor did agree to take money out of our stabilization fund. and This would replenish it. <clears throat> A few more specific items related to counties that that's included in this budget, I'll just list them all. Uh, there's $15 million for the dam safety emergency fund. And a lot of this revolves around the dam in Midland uh, that uh, had, a, had the disaster last year. Um, 
$40 million to fund high water level and resilient infrastructure and planning grants to local government to address high water issues such as flooding and erosion. $5 million for first responder training. $290 million in infrastructure grants for the Michigan Clean Water Plan to address sewage overflow and mitigate public health risks by removing sewage discharge. $148 million for the Michigan Indigent Defense Commission to adhere to state mandates for defense services. $262 million for the Child Care Fund. Uh, as I said, $9 million in the Raise the Age Fund. $12 million for Secondary Road Patrol. $4 million for the County Veterans Service Fund. $14 million for the County Jail Reimbursement Program. $51 million uh, go to our in essential public health services and $13 million to the community corrections. So that is the state budget. The legislature now and their subcommittees are beginning to hold hearings. Right now, what they're doing is allowing the fiscal agency and the department directors to make their presentation to go through in detail each of those budgets. We believe that they will begin to move those budgets out before their spring break, which is the last week of March, which they traditionally do. What you do is exchange your vision with the other chamber. Um, by law, by their own self-inflicted law, they believe that they need to get this budget done by July 1st. Um, so we will see if they are able to keep those guidelines. Now I'd like to come back to the governor's supplemental that, was, uh, that she announced on January 20th. Uh, as you can imagine, there's been a lot of consternation around this between the Republicans and Democrats. <clears throat> In response to the governor's uh, supplemental request, the House did pass a $3.5 billion supplemental, which is not anywhere near the 5.5 that she's requesting. So uh, it's significantly less. And some of the challenges that they're also requiring that the spending happens on quarterly installments. And a third piece to this puzzle is that it ties about $2 billion of the education funding to a condition that moves power over school closures and student sports from the governor to local public health officials. There's a piece of legislation that makes that requirement. Um, the House Supplemental, which is about a quarter of federal funds, also gives about $510 million to nutrition assistance benefits, $13 million to substance abuse, another $13 million to mental health, $143 million to COVID testing and contract tracing, $22 million in vaccination distribution, 162 million in emergency rental and utility assistance. And this piece I'm, I'm bringing to the attention because if the legislature is going to insist on only allowing quarterly payments, this could be a challenge for the county because it's my understanding that the county is beginning to uh, prepare to spend this money, which will mean that they will need to hire staff. And if you're only receiving quarterly payments, you're pretty much hiring staff on the promise of things to come. And I know that uh, can be challenging. So I'm working with uh, Wayman and the staff to see if we can um, request that the legislature not do that piece on a quarterly basis, if they'll understand the challenges that um, offers to county. So I just bring that up as something that we need to uh, really take a deeper dive on. Uh, they also put $150 million into unemployment compensation uh, $22 million to waive the property tax penalties and interests for unpaid property taxes just for 2020. And then $565 million for programs to help businesses affected by COVID. Now the Senate just recently did their response, which was even less than the, than the, than the House. They only provided $2 billion uh, in a supplemental. They did not re have the requirement uh, that the, the condition of theirs where local public health has the authority over the governor. They did not include that piece, which is good news. Um, about a billion is in education funding, 500 million is in DHHS for vaccines and to support local health departments, which I think is important. We've had a lot of dialogue with the Senate Majority Leader on expenses to the county for local public health. So they put 36 million to support local health departments. But they also put in a, um, a provision that any additional funds had to receive legislative approval, <clears throat> which uh, is the problem. We believe that the, the legislature plans to move their supplemental this week. The challenge with that is that they negotiated with one another and they did not negotiate with the state budget office, director of Asseron or the governor's office. So it's really only their budget, 
only their vision of the supplemental and it doesn't include a dialogue or conversation with the governor's office or the state budget office. We don't know how the governor is going to respond. Clearly, it probably depends on what the legislature includes in it, but we do anticipate that um, that, will, that will happen this week in the legislature. There are a couple other pieces of legislation I want to brought, uh, bring to your attention. There's a broadband legislation that just moved from the Senate, which would provide a property tax exemption for broadband expenses. <clears throat> that again is costly to the county. <clears throat> we did, we're able to um, raise the threshold for reimbursement, which does help a lot, but it does not provide reimbursement to counties. So we'll continue to talk with members of the legislature about that. There's also legislation on the veteran service fund that would continue that, which is important. It was a priority, if you would call, of then Senator, uh, I'm sorry, then Representative Wentworth is now Speaker Wentworth. So we anticipate that uh, veteran services will continue to be funded <clears throat> at the full level. I know that's a lot of information, a lot of detail. I would be happy to ask any questions that anyone might have or get additional detail for any of the programs that I mentioned that you need more. <clears throat> All right, well, thank you, Becky, for teeing that up. As you say, there's an awful lot of balls in the air right now. So there are questions, questions or comments from commissioners. I'm not seeing any hands up while they're thinking. You can um, help me understand a little bit on the direct care wage issue, which is, you know, is huge across the state. Uh, the last thing I had heard yesterday is while it's in the supplemental, it may not get percolated through until June or July. Um, and as you probably know, all of the PIHPs are having to basically fund this out of their own pockets in the meantime, or tell the workers that you have to go back to the old wage, which is simply not workable. So this is, this is putting a huge crunch on the entire behavioral health system. So <clears throat> is that sense of urgency present uh, at all levels? And is there any chance that that's gonna get through the system earlier than June or July? Um, I believe so. It's my understanding that the current uh, $2 increase has been funded through, I think, March 1st or somewhere March. in March. Um, I think it, yeah, up until the end of February. Right. Okay. So the supplemental was um, trying to bridge that gap between March 1st and September 30th and then get to the, to the 22 budget. I do believe by the email traffic that I saw last night from Senator Stamas that, that they will have that $2 increase in uh, their proposal, it might be expanded uh, beyond just the direct care workers of uh, just a tiny bit. But yes, I believe that'll be in there. I guess the unknown is how the governor will respond because I'm sure there are other things in this supplemental that she's not gonna care for. That's just how it happens. Uh, but yes, right. I believe the legislature, if they voted on this before, it hasn't been a controversial issue with them. I think they understand the importance of it. So can the system assume once it gets approved, it would be retroactive too? March one, or is the system going to have to swallow it until at some point it gets approved? I think they'll, I, I, and let me check on that to make sure that they would okay. make, I don't think it is their intent that the entities need to, to fill in that gap. But let me make sure that that piece is retroactive to March 1st, if it doesn't get signed into law before then. Okay, at least for our region, it's about a million dollars a month. Uh, an out-of-pocket cost for us to keep that going. So. Okay, I will get some answers for you this week. Thank you. All right, any other questions from commissioners? Commissioner Skaggs, or do you have your hand up for the visor? <laughs> He's on mute. Hand up for the visor. Oh, all right. Not until I say uh, my, my uh, geographic... Uh, location is going to continually change through this meeting just <laughs> you only had to identify the car you're in i think all right any other questions well you either gave them too much to deal with becky or uh um Perhaps. yeah obviously this will this will be ongoing and uh, we're going to have to track a lot of these things over the course of the next weeks and months and uh, look forward to having you back to keep us up to date on how that's progressing so Absolutely. Well, if anybody has any questions that they think of along the way, please email me or call me. All right, good. Thank you so much for your presentation. Absolutely. Thank you.
All right, let's move to item number four, which is a performance management review team update, uh, a review update from Mary Beth Ventil, who is here uh, to give us uh, a presentation on that. You are muted. You're muted. Of course I'm muted. <sighs> Morning. Thanks for the opportunity to provide an update on this morning's county performance management process. Let's see here. The county's performance management program began in 1997 and has evolved to become an integral part of county operations. It, has, it began as a conscious effort to respond to the county's mission at the time, which was to be an effective and efficient steward in delivering quality services for our diverse community. In 1997, it was primarily about counting things, and I know we've brought that up in the past. There was not yet a standard for reporting or even a standard for the collection of measures. Uh, the, Program remained largely unchanged until March of 2008 when the Board of Commissioners approved an administrative policy on performance measurements and results. This policy required county departments to establish performance measures and report them annually to the Legislative and Human Resources Committee. The addition of this policy was a pivotal shift for the program. It's also something that continues to make Kent County's performance management program unique a lot of other counties do not have this in, embedded in their policy. County administration made this decision to evolve from simply counting things to now aligning and engaging employees, improving the process and assisting departments in telling their story and reporting their progress. In 2019, the board approved a new strategic plan. This provided yet another opportunity for the county to evaluate its current measurement program review perhaps old and outdated metrics and enhance our process again. Today, Kent County is positioned to continue the momentum and move performance management forward by strengthening the alignment of performance management with the Kent County strategic plan and engaging each department at every level of performance, effectiveness, and innovation. This morning, I'm gonna walk you through kind of who we are Take a look at where we're going, how we're getting there, and what's coming next. So first of all, who is Kent County? Well, if you go out to our website, you can find out a number of things that we are, right? We are fiscally responsible and tout 22 consecutive years of a AAA bond rating. We are ranked the first metro area to raise a family by Forbes. We are the second best large city to start a business. And all in all, we're a great place to work, live, and play. But we are also defined by what we believe, our vision for the future, and how we agree to behave. Our mission serves as a single functional statement that defines Kent County administration's role in achieving this vision. Our mission is set by the Board of Commissioners and the County Administrator. Our current mission statement was updated in 2019 at the same time as the strategic plan. Our vision serves as a single encompassing statement about the future state of the county. And it is also set by the Board of Commissioners. Our values articulate what we as an organization stand for. These values prevail across the organization and are reflected in our vision, mission, and goals. Together, these elements provide a foundation for our work and a vision for our future. This too is who we are. So now that we know who we are, where are we going? That too is largely defined by our Board of Commissioners. In September of 2018, the county embarked on a comprehensive strategic planning process to envision a desired future state for the county. And to translate that vision into priorities, goals, as well as refine our mission and vision over the next three to five years. The strategic plan is the backbone of all department performance measures and objectives. While many of our services are mandated by state and federal statutes, 
The strategic plan is our guidepost to what we seek to accomplish in our community. <clears throat> the priorities as displayed on the screen are a set of five major accomplishments that Kent County administration seek to fulfill in pursuit of its mission. Within each of these priorities are several goals. Goals serve as a pathway to fulfill the county priorities. Some of our goals, as you read through, you'll notice that they are specific to individual departments, while others span across the organization. In everything that we do, our alignment is with the priorities and goals of the strategic plan. With our eyes focused on the strategic direction, this combined with who we are, drives our county culture. Culture will define itself if we do not actively create the culture that we seek. Strong county government requires a culture that is thoughtful, collaborative, and agile. It requires a culture of excellence. By implementing a culture of excellence, we are building an organization where our employees feel empowered, inspired, and motivated. The first step of developing that culture is to develop this mindset of excellence. Our administration has worked to create a mindset within our leadership that is committed to engaging and aligning every employee with our board's strategic vision and our values, and to help all of us speak a common language of excellence. Having this mindset of excellence represents a conscious choice to decide to be the best and to do what it takes to honor that decision. Excellence is something that is intentional. Developing a culture of excellence is the difference that contributes most to, to team performance and the organization's overall success. This shared culture begins with unity around the vision values and alignment with the strategic plan. Our performance pro management program is a documented process that cultivates the language we use to express our performance, strategy, and significant accomplishments. So now that we know who we are and what we're doing, how are we going to get to our destination? And again, we're going to get there first by talking about measurement. Today, governments and organizations must show accountability to their stakeholders. Sharing strategic objectives and progress towards them helps to build trust with the people that we're trying to reach. Highlighting key achievements toward county goals proves that we're doing the work that we promised to do. It also demonstrates the value that county employees and their departments provide, helping to improve relations with residents as well as increase staff morale. There are many reasons to measure performance. The main reason local governments measure performance is to ensure that the services delivered make a difference in our residents' lives. A well-executed performance management program can create a number of additional benefits for local governments and serves to build trust within the community, achieve accountability and transparency, support planning and goal setting, improve efficiencies and effectiveness, and the list can go on and on. Particularly when teams can see how easily they're tracking towards their target, it helps motive them, motivate them to push through to completion. Employees can see that they are part of a bigger picture and take pride in how they are contributing to making the community better. From the very beginning, one of the drivers for establishing the performance management program uh, was to enhance the county's decision making ability and assist uh, make sure that we are using our resources effectively. To assist with this, we have the performance management review team which is made up of representatives from county departments, elected officials, and judiciary. And this team was created to work with departments to refine their measures and assure that they are linked to the board's strategic plan. The charter of the PMRT, as we call it, is to establish an effective system of performance management and measures and make informed strategic decisions and maintain accountability for Kent County resources. The PMRT is a peer group that helps departments refine their measures and ensure they are aligned. It is comprised of department leaders who provide support, encouragement, and peer-to-peer -peer feedback. The PMRT also serves as a sounding board as we consider initiatives or explore new software. In a moment, we'll talk about our Excellence in Action Award program, 
And our PMRT also serves as judges for those significant accomplishments. Just as the culture of excellence begins with the vision, values, and that common language, the performance management process really begins with relationships. Our primary goal is to build relationships and provide support to department directors and staff. We evaluate department relationships through communicating successes and providing accountability. There's a few things that happen behind the scenes that I wanted to share with you prior to when a department comes to present to you. Uh, we typically have a, a scheduled meeting with members of the PMRT meeting with the specific department that's gonna do their presentation. At that meeting, not only do, does staff explain the PM process and make sure that they have the, the technical know-how to update their measures. But we also ask leading questions about the kind of information they want to share with LHR. Uh, we talk about how they're achieving, achieving their objectives, how they're making efficient use of resources, and how what they do impacts the residents of Kent County. We also asked departments some culture questions about how they drive excellence within their department um, and how their office supports a culture of belonging for all employees. In a few weeks, we'll be having a work session where we will be asking you if our current reporting process is meeting your needs as commissioners. Please think about how we can improve to serve you and the needs of your residents better if there are things that are, are missing or if we're sharing too much, um, I'll be looking for that feedback in a few weeks. Celebration is also a key element in establishing this culture and honoring the, the uh, accomplishments of our departments. The Excellence in Action program began in 2016 and recognizes the accomplishments in four different categories, community impact, collaboration, innovation, and then diversity, equity, and inclusion. We are currently in the process of soliciting departments for their significant accomplishments or examples of excellence. We will then have the PMRT judge the submissions and submit their scores. We also involve external judges from the community that also rate and judge the submissions. We honor the Excellence in Action Award winners during the Public Service Recognition Week, which is typically the first week of May. This last piece here, Collaborative Analytics, is probably the newest item within the last two years. We have a core analytics team of Mike, Sandra, and Jen. But I use the word collaborative analytics because nothing that we do could be done without the expertise of others in the organization. The internal backbone uh, is looking to produce results, but we can't do that without the participation of our, extra, of our departments. We have a number of things that we have uh, done with departments, and I'll go into that next to kind of show you what, what has been new as we look at also what is next. It was interesting, as I prepared for this presentation, I was looking back to a presentation that Wayman had prepared in 2016. And he wrote, the next step in performance management will include data, visual, data visualization to demonstrate progress towards goals and strategic plan priorities in a way that is easily consumable by county employees, commissioners, and residents. And has the continuous alignment from the employee all the way to the strategic plan. He also wrote that he wanted to heighten the use, the strategic use of storytelling so that we can talk about the good work that we do. So that was five years ago. And here we are today actually implementing that vision that he had talked about. So enhanced data and integration. Similar to a dashboard on your car, we have data dashboards. Okay, the purpose of a data dashboard is to provide a unified view of our data, make analytics more accessible, and also protect sensitive data so that we aren't sharing too much information or private information. In an effort to be transparent and promote public trust, it's the county's intent to provide 
performance information to the public that demonstrates progress towards achievement of those long-term goals. A data dashboard is a tool that provides a centralized interactive means of monitoring, measuring, analyzing, and extracting, extracting relevant insights. To name a few in the past two years, our team has partnered with 17th Circuit Court on an analysis of jury pools. We've partnered with the health department for analysis of elevated blood levels in children. We've engaged with the sheriff's office on analytics related to pre-trial incarceration. We are actively working with human resources on their higher reach program. We have worked with the clerk's office on election security, Department of Public Works on the Fallsburg Dam, with the Trevor treasurer's office on property tax data, and then most recently with the health department on the COVID dashboard community outreach, and now vaccine. Our data dashboards look something like this. This is probably looking like Greek to you, but this is something that Mike Fortman created for Matt Wolford in equalization. And this allows Matt to use this dashboard to monitor the work of his assessors. Another data dashboard that I'm sure you've seen is with the health department. This too was uh, operating out of the administrator's office, but it organizes, stores, and displays a lot of the information that we have been wanting to know about COVID in our community and how we compare to the state. We have another type of dashboard that sits out on Access Kent. In August of this past year, we published the online strategic plan performance dashboard. Uh, this dashboard allows residents to drill down on our strategic plan priorities and see exactly how we're measuring success in each of these factors. At a high level, you'll see a summary of our progress. Down below each one of those uh, colored bars represents the aggregate pros uh, progress. Green means it's on track. Yellow indicates that there's been some disruption. Red indicates a major disruption and blue indi indicates a project that is completed. If you click on one of those priority areas, you can see more specific information. So if I click on excellence and service delivery, I can now see the five goals that are established in our strategic plan that fall under that particular priority. Clicking on one of these goals, I will get again more detailed information. So for this goal, embracing innovation and continuous improvement, I can see that we have operationalized an eviction diversion program remote work support, improved communications, and there are more listed out on the website that you too can also go out and take a look at. Additionally, we have engaged in the art of data storytelling. Um, in the past, data and analytics teams have created dashboards and visual visualizations but often we, we forgot that piece of now telling the story that goes with it. And so this next piece really gets at how do we tell the story or write the narrative about the data that we are producing? It's important to note that there is no one visualization that works for all situation. Um, storytellers must use fitting visuals to go along with the narrative so that they can present a holistic story. So it's that visualization plus the narrative and the content. Some recent examples over the last year of data storytelling that we've engaged in are also out on our website. Uh, these narratives combine data and the compelling story so that our residents can see what we've done in these different categories and how we have mitigated the adverse impact. We are currently evaluating a new uh, software program that can enhance our storytelling ability and we will be uh, purchasing that very soon and getting that up and running in the next month or two. Again, you can see that these are all ways that we can tell our story to our community, to our residents, 
and mark progress on our strategic plan. This last slide just represents that holistic integration. You know, we started out with a common language with alignment, vision and values. The way that we get to where we're going is by building relationships, providing departmental support, and communicating to you through our presentations. This entire process, though, allows us to have that constructive accountability, recognizing and celebrating our goals and our accomplishments, but then also telling our story to our public. And that is all I have for you today. Do you have any questions? Thank you. Mary Beth, and particularly thank you for uh, giving us uh, an excellent primer on the entire process that we have uh, we've been uh, creating, in large part due to the work of you and others at the administration, and in, uh, in helping us find the most effective way to accomplish our our vision and our missions. And so, as you said, one of the things that uh, we are looking to do uh, in the coming weeks is to set a work session to talk about as commissioners. Um, how is this system, um, now that it's been functioning for a while, how is it best working? How are this um, perhaps be um, modified or tweaked? And, uh, and in what way is this best equipping us as the commissioners ultimately responsible to assure that this is moving in the right direction? How, how is this uh, working and servicing for us? So we will have a chance uh, at some point here to, uh, to fillet that much more in detail, uh, but are there any questions uh, or comments from commissioners now? We had a quiet group this morning. Maybe it's the new format and uh, it's got a hidden secret to it somehow. <laughs> I, don't, I don't have a question, uh, Stan, just a comment. Um, yes. It, it was a very impressive presentation and I'm, I guess what I, I'm looking forward to going in and with this in my mind, looking through this, especially from the point of view of how a constituent could find all of this. I think it's going to be super helpful in um, communicating with constituents. So thanks. That's yeah. very, very helpful to me. And I look forward to uh, going into it and following some of these paths on the website, especially the dashboard. So thanks hey. for that. Okay. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it reminds me that uh, in, in many ways, this is kind of circular. It starts with the, um, uh, the constituents our residents out there and it sort of ends with us as the representatives of those constituents. So great. Uh, and by the way, uh, Mary Beth, let's make sure that your slides uh, get distributed to all the members okay. of the committee. Uh, we'll I do. think it's helpful for them to have that uh, as a resource for them as we uh, get closer to this work session. Any other questions or comments? All right, I don't see any. Again, thank you so much, Mary Beth. I know you, uh, you put a lot of work into that uh, very, very clearly. And so it is, uh, it's a clear presentation and um, uh, will uh, we'll serve us well as we get into this conversation. Great, thanks. All right, let's move to item number five, uh, which is a uh, board appointment to the pension or appointment to the pension board. Wayman, will you present this issue? Sure, this is a recommendation to the Board of Commissioners to appoint Steve Bukema to the Pension Board to fill an unexpired three-year term ending December 31st, 2020 A midterm vacancy occurred on the Pension Board. Solicitation of applicants occurred in the months following the vacancy to fill the vacant positions. An interview team consisting of Commissioners Podstein, Hennessy, Teal, uh, reviewed applications and interviewed candidates. The interview team is recommending the appointment of Steve Bukema to fill the remainder of the term. Is there a motion for that appointment? Moved by Ponstein. Commissioner Ponstein is moved for the appointment. Is there a support? Grand support. Support by Commissioner Grand. Any further discussion? Um, I don't, oh yes, Commissioner Ponstein. Thank you, Chair Steck. Just wanted to thank staff. We started out with 11 really 
good candidates and it was tough to whittle it down. So I was impressed with the uh, effort that went forward of getting the word out. There were several different sources uh, that people cited on how they got this. So I wanted to thank Pam and Natasha for their work. Thank you, Commissioner. Anything else for commissioners? Don't see any otherwise. Uh, yes, I join in thanking the interview team for its work in uh, in following up and reviewing and doing it, the uh, difficult task of sorting through that. This is reflective of uh, of a nice issue to have or problem to have, if you will. That uh, we are getting a significant number of uh, applications for these positions and and good quality applications. So. Uh, that makes it a little more difficult to have to sift through it, but I, uh, I think you've done a great job here in uh, coming back with this recommendation. So if there's nothing else, let's uh, go ahead and call the roll on this. Commissioner Burrell. Commissioner Burrell. I think he did a yes. Okay, I just couldn't hear it, I'm sorry. Commissioner Hennessy. Yes. Commissioner no. Calvin. Commissioner LeGrand. Yes. Commissioner McLeod. Yes. Commissioner Ponstein. Yes. Mr. Skaggs. Yes. Commissioner Teal. Yes. Chair Steck. Yes. Motion passes. All right, excellent, good. Um, next item of business is miscellaneous. If any commissioner has a miscellaneous item. I don't see any. Um, I will just, uh, just a reminder that we do have a work session to finish up our legislative priority conversation starting at 9.30 uh, today. So uh, we'll maybe have time for a short break here before we uh, reconvene. Uh, and it's hoped that we'll be able to uh, finish up our conversation then or almost finish it up. Uh, and then just a reminder to folks, we still have two openings that we are uh, yet uh, needed to fill in the fire commission. And we now have one in the uh, LA, I think it's the LRE oversight policy board that has one position as well. So we'll continue to work on that. All right, with that, unless there is anything else, we are adjourned and we'll see hopefully many of you at 930. Thank you.